Thank you so much. God bless you. You may be seated. What a great joy to be with you tonight and to be able to share the word. And my goal is that tonight when you leave here, you will increase in faith and in vision and in your capacity for what God has got for your life. Um, I want to speak tonight on a subject that I've entitled Mountain Moving Faith. Mountain Moving Faith. Moving that which stands as an impossibility in front of you, that thing that glares at you and seeks to intimidate you, that appears to be immovable, but in the authority of God and with faith, that thing can move and be cast out of your path, that thing that is hindering your advance, your growth, your healing, your development, that is subject to you. As you speak the word, believing it, it will be done for you. Now, you all know that faith comes by and hearing by. Well, faith can also go by hearing what people say. Just as faith comes by hearing, faith can go. When circumstances speak to you, it can eradicate your faith. When demons lie to you, it can eradicate your faith. When you hear teachers who somehow have got offended because someone bought a Learjet or a new Bentley and because they have prospered and they feel like it's a waste of resource, they just throw the whole thing out and rob people of faith. Don't be moved by what someone does or what someone doesn't do. Be moved by what God says for you. And listen, if someone is doing something wrong, how many of you know God is big enough to look after his people? If it's not in your sphere of authority, why are you trying to address something that you've got no voice to? The church has become so critical at times so mean-spirited. They don't know what's gone on behind the scenes. What if someone walked up to you and said, hey, God spoke to me and said, I'm to give you the money to buy a mansion. Are you going to say, no, I'm going to offend someone. I'm going to turn it down. (laughs) So you don't know what happened. And because that person prospered, oh, he's using God's money robbing widows, robbing single moms. You don't know who came and gave him that money. What if he had sowed millions and God said, it's coming back to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together. We'll throw out faith because of someone's prosperity. (laughs) And so people listen to these critics and what it does is anyone that has any message of faith is immediately placed in a slot that they after your stuff. They want to rob you of your resource, plunder you so that they can have it all. Don't be moved by what some deadhead person living in poverty and with a critical spirit pointing fingers at someone that they've got no voice to has got to say, listen to what God says. And if they're wrong, how many of you know he is the God of the universe? He knows everything. Nothing is hid from his eyes. Today I'm believing that faith will increase in you, that faith will expand in you, and that you'll be built up in your most holy faith, a holy faith a trust that is found in him. I'm believing that if you have somehow in the process of time lost faith, that it will be recovered tonight. That lost faith, because you prayed for someone and they weren't healed, you think this thing doesn't work. If you've lost faith, you believed God and it didn't work out, and you grew weary in well-doing, And you lost faith tonight, I'm believing for the restoration of your lost faith. Now, 
Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith, never applauded someone for little or no faith. He never said, oh, wow, such little faith, that impresses me. (laughs) But he did applaud great faith. And he did say, oh, you of little faith, how much longer must I put up with you? (laughs) Yes, Leon's expanded unpublished translation. Your little faith irritates me. (laughs) You should be believing, not disbelieving. And Jesus said, will I find faith? Well, right here in this little circle, here's one that's going to be believing you. What about you? Remember, we are saved by grace through faith. So you saved by faith. Now, isn't it weird how easy it is to believe that if we call on the name of the Lord, we shall be saved, and you instantly believe that you're born again and you're on your way to glory? <laughs> and then when you're facing a mountain, how difficult it is to get your faith together for that thing to move. You need that childlike innocence that believes that when you pray, God hears, God answers and does the miracle in you and you stand in that. I wanna stay innocent in my faith. I wanna have childlike faith. That if God said it, that's it, it's settled, that's what I'm gonna believe. And even when circumstances don't work out like I'm believing, I'm still gonna believe. Because if I die, I'm gonna die in faith. I'm going to die believing God. I'm not going to die complaining that somehow God has failed me. You know what really annoys me is Christians who get mad at God. Just remember, it is he who has made you and not you yourself. He is God. He's not some dysfunctional parent. He's not your buddy. He's creator of the universe. And the word declares of God that God is good and that he is the giver of every good and perfect gift. Don't go blaming God for what the devil is doing in your life. Thinking somehow that God has done that to you. Get your perspective right. (laughs) We are saved by, we are justified by, we walk by, we pray in, The prayer of heals the (laughs) faith in his name has made this man whole (laughs) according to your be it. (laughs) Without faith it is. What does impossible mean? Not possible. (laughs) Impossible. Go look at the Greek. (laughs) So when God says, His word declares to you that without faith, it is impossible to please God. The way that pleases God is to have faith. Without faith, it is impossible, not possible, to please God. Wow. We walk by and not by. (laughs) Anything not done in faith is? I know that's a terrible word to say in church. (laughs) You're just quoting the word. Don't worry, you're not going to get into trouble. (laughs) Now abides these three. You guys are so well trained. What am I doing here, Pastor? I'm going home. (laughs) You guys know every scripture. You're so good. And we're to fight the... Do you see how faith just permeates everything about our life? It's in every area. Now, I've learned something about faith. Faith never stands on its own. It's always interconnected. Faith works by, doesn't stand on its own. Now, by these three, faith, hope, and love. Faith works by love. Vision is fulfilled by faith. So everything that you do is connected to something else. Faith doesn't just hang there in the state of limbo waiting for us to somehow pull it down and use it. It is already existent. 
because faith is not the product of your mind, but it is the product of the recreated spirit. And so the operations of faith is not based on logic or reasoning. It's based on his word. Like you said, you love the word of God, but we also love the God of the word who spoke and said, let there be, and there was. When he spoke, he wasn't, I hope this works. (laughs) (laughs) I know this is a big kind of a thing, but let there be, I hope it works. Like, wow, it worked. (laughs) God is the God of faith. That's why Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. So when God said, let there be, he believed it. And when the word of God gets in you and you get into the word and when you speak, the two-edged sword proceeds out of your mouth carrying that creative ability to change what stands in front of you (laughs) because you're operating in the realms of the spirit, in the realms of love, in the realms of the word and in the realms of faith. And, And so we are to operate the works of God. These signs shall follow them who believe. Here's Leon's expanded translation, unpublished. These signs shall follow people of faith. They actually believe God in the midst of a wicked and perverse. Go out everywhere preaching the good news and God is with them and God is for them and God is working through them confirming his word, the gospel, with signs following. Signs follow people of faith. Wow. The strategy of the enemy, and the Bible says, let's not be ignorant of his schemes or strategies or devices, is to attack the operations of faith. Why? Because if you have faith, you can move mountains. You can change the circumstance, the spiritual environment, the spiritual climate, as you prophesy according to your faith, as you operate in the gifts of the Spirit according to your faith, as you walk in faith, as you pray in faith, God working in and through you. So the devil sees this and he wants to rob you of faith and seed your mind with unbelief, doubt, fear, challenging these operations. Has God really said, Challenging God's word inside of you because he wants you to live as a mere man and not as a son or a daughter of the most high God operating in the works of Jesus. The works that I do, you shall do also. If you believe. (laughs) Now, if you don't believe, guess what's going to happen? Nada, nothing, zilch. Signs follow believers, and we work the works of God by faith. He not only wants to uh, challenge the operations of faith, but this is a biggie. He wants, to, he wants to challenge the operations of the Holy Spirit in the church and in your life. And so I'm glad you have River School of Ministry, the supernatural ministry, because this church is committed to its origins, to its roots, which is Pentecost, not just 1906, but Jerusalem, the upper room, we are filled with the same spirit that filled the 120 in that upper room. And we are partakers of like precious faith. The faith that they worked with and walked in is the same faith that is in you. It's not like now that we in 2024, the Holy Spirit has gone on retirement and is playing shuffleboard in Miami. And the faith that they had is now somehow diluted. It worked for them, but it doesn't work for us. So we have to understand that we are partakers of that same inheritance, that same faith, that same anointing that was in their lives as what's in our lives. But if we don't believe it, then we can't stand confidently expecting that. 
will start to doubt, will start to believe the indoctrinations of demons that have somehow crept into the church, that the church now allocates and relegates the Holy Spirit to the back room. As far as I'm concerned, church without the Holy Spirit is just a social club. We sing our songs and we pray our empty prayers and we get on with, let's eat, drink and be merry for tomorrow we diet. And so the enemy is attacking the church because we are the household of faith, the household of God. We're not the household of doubt. We're not the household of fear. We're not the household of unbelief. We are the household of faith. And so faith is so important to the church and to our lives. And Personally, I think if we could really grab hold of the reality of corporate faith, if any two shall agree as touching anything in faith, it shall be done for them. Can you imagine the collective force that we could be operating in, but we don't really buy into it enough to get to the prayer meetings? That powerful force that James writes about, that we can change the climate. James writes about Elijah, that when he prayed, that the fervent effectual prayer of a righteous man avails much. Can you imagine if two people who are made righteous by the blood of Jesus pray the effectual, effectual, fervent prayer, how much two agreeing will accomplish. If one man can change the climate, now he didn't just say, well, I decide it's not gonna rain. God said, pray and it will not rain. And then he said, pray and it will rain. And he prayed and it did not rain. And at the appointed time, he prayed that he heard the sound of the abundance, even though he couldn't see any climate change. But he believed and he ran ahead and got on with the task and then the rains came. Why? Because he was a man or a prophet of faith. And we are the household of faith and we can operate in that same dimension at the word of God. We begin to pray collectively where two or more are gathered, there he is. He hears the prayers of the saints. In the upper room, they gathered with one accord and they lifted their voices to God and God heard and they prayed the word, the promise. He said, if you stay in Jerusalem, you shall receive power. And there came a sound from heaven. They prayed what Jesus willed and promised and what happened? They were filled. And then in Acts chapter four, they gathered with one accord and they prayed and they said, God, stretch forth your hand to heal. And then God invaded that place, shook it, filled them, and then began to work great signs, wonders, and miracles at the hands of the apostles. And the church exploded in the face of persecution, hatred. Why? Because God answers the prayer of the saints in faith, collective faith. They gathered with one accord. If we would access that corporate anointing, that corporate faith, we would see great things be done. I, I believe that, yes, yes, my understanding is that faith is not the product of our reasoning faculties, our mind, the product of the recreated spirit. But I like to think of the measure of my faith is actually equal to the measure of my relationship and fellowship with God. You can't have great faith and little relationship with God. You remember Barnabas that he had, he was full of faith and of the spirit. And Stephen was full of faith and of the spirit. You can't be full full of faith and empty of the spirit and you can't be full of spirit and empty of faith 
So it is relational, not just academic, theology, doctrine. It is relationship. The measure of your faith becomes the measure of your relationship, your access to God. And so if you want to grow in faith, not just growing in the knowledge of the word, but growing in the knowledge of the God of the word. It's to know him and then to know his word. There are different measures of faith. There's no faith. There's little faith. There's some faith. There's weak faith. And then there's great faith. And Jesus said, have faith faith in God. <laughs> and I figured if Jesus wants us to have faith, how many of you know it would be impressive if he could say great faith. So that should be our goal. Not to become weird, but to operate in great faith. I love what it says in Romans chapter 4 in verses 19 to 22. Speaking about Abraham, who we declare and see as the father of faith. Am I right? We see that he operated in faith. And it says this about Abram, and not being weak in faith. So it is possible to be weak in faith, but Abraham was not weak in faith. However, I will say there was a time when he was weak in faith. Hence Ishmael. <laughs> the evidence of weak faith is Ishmael. The evidence of weak faith is, you're my sister. You understand? He wasn't always strong in faith, but he grew strong in faith. And so to anyone that has lost faith or is operating in little faith, tonight you can grow and increase in faith. You don't have to be weak in faith. You don't have to stay weak in faith. You can grow to be strong in faith. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body. This is a critical element to the operations of faith. The thing that you consider will be your reality. Your focus will be where your faith is at. If you can dare to look beyond the obvious, the surface of things, if you can dare to look beyond what is glaring at you and see the promise of God, the covenant of God, if you can get your focus on that which is louder than your circumstances, you will dominate in the realm of faith. But if you consider the natural elements, these sounds, these things, these emotions, these feelings, these circumstances, they will gain the ascendancy in your life. He did not consider his own body, which is a huge step. When you look at your body and it's already dead because you're 100 years old, and then over and above that, you got the deadness of Sarah's womb, which is glaring at you, and yet you have this promise that your body is saying the opposite. And even if you can get pushed through your own body, her body, the deadness of her womb, is also screaming at you. So it's you screaming at you, saying, Impossible. And her womb speak, uh, speaking to you saying, it's impossible. How many of you know that if you start to consider that, you're just going to walk away from the promise of God? So you have to focus and consider not your circumstances, your environment, the logic, the opinion of others. You have to lay hold of what God's word has said to you. Remember every promise. Not most or some, but every promise is yours. It is God's yes to you, and it's your amen to God. God promised them a child. But the obvious was, I'm a hundred, 
her womb is dead, but he decided not to consider his own body or the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God. James speaks about the man who has doubt, who is like the waves of the sea, tossed to and fro, waver, going between two opinions, the sound of your body, the deadness of Sarah's womb, or the word of God. You can't jump between the two. You have to get focused on what God has said, what God has promised. That becomes your reality even when the circumstances appear to be unchanged. He did not waver at the promise of God. Because the promise of God is backed by his character, by his reputation, by his name, that he watches over his word to perform it. And he's not a man that he should lie. He doesn't give us promises and then backs down on it. He is good to his word. His reputation is instilled in his word. He did not waver at the through unbelief, but strengthened, he was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. Now, you know that God visited Abraham a few times, cut covenant with him, revealed his will. I believe those encounters strengthened Abraham's weak faith. And and when you are facing circumstances that challenge you, you have to build yourself up in your most holy faith. You gotta go against your body. You gotta go against your circumstances. And what becomes the anchor is the word of God. And so, like when my son was paralyzed, And I heard the the voice of the the surgeons saying that he wouldn't live. Then they said he'd live, but he wouldn't walk. I had to remove the logic, the imagery that was being formed in my mind. I'm thinking, I'm going to have to get rid of my house, get a single story. I'm going to have to build a ramp. Well, I've got to start taking these thoughts captive. I wonder what he's going to do for a career paralyzed sitting in a wheelchair. I had to remove that. I had to replace the the doubt, the unbelief, the sound of the obvious. And I didn't go to the doctor saying, I bind you, I rebuke you, I cast you out, because they're good, caring men and women. You understand? They're not doing anything wrong. They're following the natural practices of science and medicine. But we have a higher law in operation, which is the law of the life that is found in Christ Jesus. And so we we lay in a hold of what Christ has laid hold of. And I'm not just talking about sickness. It doesn't matter what that is. If it's physical, spiritual, relational, financial, faith changes the environment. But you cannot consider that thing that says, this is impossible. You have to consider what God has said. All things are possible with him who, if you don't believe, then it's going to be impossible. So you have to believe, and to believe, you've got to consider the Word of God, not the obvious. And so he was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. In other words, even when he looked at his body, he just stood there and said, God, you're not a man that you should lie. My focus is not on the deadness of my body or the deadness of Sarah's womb, but is on you. I'm fixing my eye on Jesus, the author and the finisher of my faith. You are not a man that you should lie. Your word is truth. It abides forever. This is what I, uh, this is my reality. Sometimes people start to speak words that are contrary to the operations of faith. They start to speak their circumstances. You've got to watch your tongue. Your tongue has great power. It can start a forest fire, but it can also start a revival. Your words are carriers of life or of death. And it's one thing to say, I'm standing in faith 
when you're in front of Christians and when you get home, you start speaking the obvious. And you start to connect with people that will rub your shoulder and say, it's going to be okay, honey. This is your cross that you've got to live with and God's going to see you through. You're going to have to watch your tongue. And when you pray, you're going to have to stand with your prayer and not bring another law into operation, the law of confession. So you pray the prayer of faith, then you confess unbelief. You have a plane crash. The plane was going up, but then the power switched off. It's called unbelief, doubt, and it collapses. And then you have to build yourself up, pray, starts to take off. Then you start speaking to some kind relative. How are you doing, honey? Oh, it's not going very good. And then, bah. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. And here it is. And being fully convinced that there is the secret to the operations of faith. Not partially convinced, fully convinced. I love, I think it's the King James that says fully persuaded. Fully persuaded, fully convinced. I want to persuade my mind, my body, my bank balance, my circumstances, my relationships, my environment. I want to be fully persuaded, not at what is staring at me, mocking the God inside of me. I want to be persuaded by what God has said. Because that's my reality if I can believe it. If I can stand in that, that becomes my circumstances. Remember, everything that you face today is subject to change. God's word will never change. How many of you have ever received something in your mailbox that wasn't to you? It was addressed to someone else. What do you do? You take a pen, you put RTS, and you put it back in. What does RTS stand for? You guys are brilliant. I'm, I don't know what I'm doing here. You return it to the sender because it's not yours. I wish people would do that with sickness. I wish people would do that with contradictory circumstances. And return it to sender because it's not from God. It's not God's will. God's will was made up when Jesus went to the cross and took upon himself your sin, your sickness, your poverty, your debt, your disease, your discouragement. Every weapon that the devil had placed on humanity, Jesus dealt it a death blow. That's his promise to you. And you have to become fully persuaded of that, not by what has been sent to you that's not got your name on it, but somehow it's found itself in your mailbox. Oh, I better open this and see what it's about. This is for me. When something contrary to the word of God comes to my body, to my circumstance, I don't say, this is mine. I don't put a name to it and say, this is mine. I say, this is not mine. I don't say, this is my headache. Because the moment you, you take ownership of it, it becomes yours. I will say, this is not from God and it's not mine it is subject to change. That's me. He was fully persuaded that what God had promised, he was able to perform. And therefore, it was accounted to him for righteousness. So, let me go to a famous scripture for faith, and I'll try and wrap it up for you. In Mark chapter 11 and verse 22 and 23. And Jesus answered and said to them, well, what's the context? The context was there was a tree 
that Jesus had cursed because it had no fruit, even though it wasn't in fruit-bearing season. <laughs> Think about that for a moment. And I ask myself, why? Were you having a bad hair day? <laughs> or were you wanting to teach your disciples something that you had to get their attention to revolutionize their life, that they wouldn't think like mere men, but they would start to think as sons of God. That's my conclusion. Jesus never sinned, never failed. He wasn't having a bad hair day, but he knew I need to teach my disciples something because they're gonna face mountains, circumstances that are gonna be so severe that if they don't know their authority, if they don't know how faith operates, they will handle it like mere men. And so he cursed the tree and they came back and it had withered from the roots and was dying. Am I correct? That's the context. So Jesus answered them about this tree that had started to wither and die. And he said to them, have faith in God. That's worthy of underlying. If you're going to have something, have faith in God. Today, people boast in their unbelief. They boast in their doubt. They, in fact, someone came to me and said, are you one of those faith preachers? I said, yes, I am. <laughs> I just took the bait. I was like a goldfish swimming and suddenly there was an a, a, a earthworm right in front of me and I just took it. She said, ooh, I've got a faith preacher here. I'm going to humiliate you. I said, I am one of those. I said, but you thinking I'm after stuff. You think I'm after jet planes and the latest motor car or whatever. I said, I'm using my faith not for stuff, but for souls, for miracles, planting churches, and changing my world. Just depends, what, what are you? Do you want a preacher that doesn't believe to preach to you, or do you want a believing preacher to, believe, to preach to you? I said, what kind of a pastor do you want? Do you want one in faith or one in unbelief? And suddenly, I, I guess I humiliated her, but she tried to humiliate me. And so I heaped coals upon her head and blessed her with revelation knowledge. Someone also came to me one day and said, are you one of those hyper-faith preachers? Well, hyper has different meanings. It could mean excessive, like hyperactive, but it could also mean a lot, huge amount. I said, yes, I'm one of those. <laughs> Because Jesus said, great faith, I want to have a lot of faith. I want to impress Jesus. That he would say, I haven't seen such great faith for a long time. The last person was a Syrophoenician woman. And then there was that Roman centurion. And then there's Leon Van Royen. I like him. to relegate some kind of a reputation on you because you're faith. But Jesus said, have faith in God. He didn't say, have doubt, have unbelief, have fear. He said, have faith. So when Jesus says, have something, how many of you know it's good for you to have what he says you should have? <laughs> then he said this, and I'll break this down in more detail. I'm getting ahead of myself, but I like to. I get so excited about the word. He said, for assuredly, I say to you. When Jesus said assuredly, I love the King James. The King James says, verily, verily, I say unto thee. I can hardly pronounce it with my accent, verily, verily. <laughs> it's like, come here. I was praying for someone for the spirit of boldness. And they said, please stop praying for me. 
I said, what? He said, I don't want to be bold. I said, I'm not praying for the spirit of boldness. I'm praying for the spirit of boldness. <laughs> when Jesus said, assuredly I say to you, Yes, Leon's expanded, unpublished translation. The truth said, I am telling you the truth. This is worthy of taking note. If you say to this mountain, and do not doubt, you will have what you say. In other words, the truth gave them the truth. Or how about this one? The word himself gave them the word. And he said, Listen, I'm going to give you something that you can, you can bank on this. You can stand on this. Assuredly, I say to you, of a truth, I'm telling you, this circle, underline, and put a big exclamation mark and say, this is mine. For assuredly, I, wow, just that word's big enough to circle, say, to you, whoever, there is no limitation. This is an open ticket to whoever. You can put your name there and say, Jesus said to me that if I say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and I do not doubt in my heart but believe that those things he says will be done. I will have whatever he says. Wow. You can put your name there. This is yours. You can say, this was given to them on that day, but it's been given to me today. Wow. For surely I say to you, whoever, that's you, says to this mountain. Now, Here's where some people go wrong. The other day I was listening to a worship song. It's a good one. I hope you don't sing it here. <laughs> it's really got a nice sound to it. It says, and God will move the mountains. God, God doesn't move mountains. You move the mountains. Look up on your playlist and see if you sing it. I would change the words. God doesn't move the mountains. God allows you to move the mountains. He said, if you say to the mountain, if you don't say, it's not moving. In other words, to you. You can change your environment or you can live with it. But I'm putting this in your hands. You can deal with it. If you don't say to it, it's going to stay. Am I reading it right? He didn't say, I will move the mountains. He said, if you say to the mountain, if you don't say to the mountain, it's like the church the other day. I was preaching on according to your faith, be it unto you. And you remember when the blind man said, son of David, have mercy on me. And then Jesus, they try to shush him. And then Jesus said, let him come. And then Jesus turns around to a blind man and says to him, what do you want me to do for you? Like, duh. But Jesus wanted him to speak what he needed. And suddenly the Spirit of the Lord said to me, tell my people that I beckoned for them to come to me. I'm standing in front of them saying, what do you want me to do for you? I said to the church, if you will speak to the Lord right now, he said, I will do it for you. And I said to this, don't whisper, don't think it, but say it. And I watched the people. Pastor, I'm not exaggerating. Two thirds of the church stood like this. And I'll tell you this, I watched two on the front row and a lady on the third, on the second row, I saw the glory hit them. They went, whoa! As the power of God, as they spoke, two men were healed of cancer. I know both of them. And the lady was powerfully touched by God. 
and others were healed according to his word. And, I, and, and then the pastor, God bless him, he said at the end of the meeting, now let's pray for those who need their miracle. And I'm thinking, it's too late. <laughs> it's too late. And then the people that were touched came forward. I said, what are you doing here? Did you ask? Then you've received. Go take your seat. Why are you wanting me to now pray? Are you unbelieving, believing, or are you believing? Did you believe? Did you ask? Then you received. Go take your seat. It sounds rude and harsh, but I didn't want to nullify the operations of faith in their heart, but now thinking, well, the big gun is here. Now we can receive. Jesus was there. And if I said that to the believers, you don't want to hear what I told the rest that remained standing. You'll say, Leon's a very harsh man. But I'm dealing with people that are disobedient. They didn't hear what the Spirit of God said. Now they want the miracle touch. When Jesus, the miracle worker, said, if you ask, you shall receive. I said to them, you have not because you ask not. Ask right now. Jesus said in his word, call unto me and I will answer you. If he gave you invitation to ask, he gave you invitation to call. He said, I will do great and mighty things. Why are you silent? If I was in need, I would be screaming it out. Son of David, have mercy on me. I need my sight. That's me. I'm not going to whisper there. When he said ask, and the Spirit of God was very specific, ask. Don't whisper. Don't think it. Speak it. And with the mountain, you don't want to whisper to it. You want to say to it. In other words, have a little bit of authority. The authority is not in the volume, but at least have some volume. Enough for demons to hear, enough for angels to hear, enough for circumstances to hear. I say to you, whoever, that's you, says to this mountain, what's a mountain? An immovable object standing in front of you. An impossibility. If you say to it, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt. Now listen, if you face doubt, doubt is not as bad as unbelief. Unbelief just doesn't believe. Doubt believes and it's double-minded. Believes, doesn't believe. believe. Uh, if you can get rid of doubt, if you have doubt in your heart, Deal with it. How did I deal with doubt when the imagery of my son started to fill my mind? I went to the Word. And I took every scripture in the Old and the New Testament concerning healing and miracles. And I was in a little hotel room in England. Not because I was cheap. But the hotels in England are sometimes so small. I had a double bed, and if I got out of bed, I had to walk this way to get <laughs> to the bathroom. I didn't have room for my suitcase, and it was a, a good hotel, but I had this little passageway, and I had all these healing scriptures, and for two days, I replaced every doubt with the Word of God. I prayed it, I spoke it, I prophesied it for two days. Just prayed it. Until it got in my heart and doubt got out. I started to look at the goodness of God, the promise of God. I replaced every image of doubt. I took every thought captive that was contrary to the word of God until my mind submitted to the word. I considered the word, not his body. I considered the word until I became so fully persuaded by it. And then that became my reality. 
And the Spirit of the Lord said to me, in two weeks you will walk out. I went to my son, I said, in two weeks you will walk out. In two weeks to the day he walked out. But I had doubts. And if you've got doubts, don't say, mountain be lifted up and cast in the sea, and then there's doubt. Deal with the doubt. Remove the doubt until your heart becomes persuaded by the word of God. And then speak to your mountain in faith, and then it will be removed. And he says here that those things he says with faith will be done. He will have whatever. Now, there's two whatevers. There's a whatever that your wife says to you. Whatever. That's not the whatever there. And all the men said, (laughs) how many of your wives have turned to your husband and said, whatever. That's not the whatever Jesus is speaking yet. The whatever there, and this is ridiculous, is whatever. The only limitation is the smallness of your mind and your unbelief. The boundary lines have fallen for you in pleasant places. I'm not talking about greed. I'm not talking about going after stuff. I'm talking about going after your miracle breakthrough. You understand, for your life. This isn't Western worldview that the measure of your success is found in what you own. I'm talking about the discipled life, the disciplined life, the godly life. You have not because you ask amiss. In other words, they're asking to consume it upon themselves. They don't need it, but they just want it. That's not the whatever there. The whatever is a godly whatever. It's according to his will. It's according to his word. It's according to his generosity. You need to expand your whatever about the promise of God. Don't have small thinking, little thinking, poverty mindedness. You need to start thinking liberally. You need to start thinking with expectation. That whatever he says, it will be done. Have faith in God can be also interpreted, have the faith of God. Because it's from faith to faith. God's faith through the gospel becomes your faith. (laughs) And so have the faith of God. The word brings the faith of God. Have faith in God, have the faith of God, or have the faith from God. It's just three angles that you're looking at the same word. It's faith of God, it's faith from God, and it's faith in God. Has all the same meaning. We to place our trust in God. For assuredly, he says to us, he's promised, he's watching over his word to perform it. The truth is telling you the truth. Whoever says to this impossibility, be removed and cast into the sea and does not doubt, he will have what he says. All things are possible with God and all things are possible with you if you believe. All things there being within the parameters of God's character, nature, generosity. But you have access to the unlimited supply of heaven. Everything that you would ever need, he has in abundance. And when you've extracted all that you have needed for your life, you have not even made a dent in the endless supply of God. With God, nothing will be impossible. With you, all things are possible if you believe. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. There is nothing 
that you cannot do within the boundaries of his love and his generosity. Get rid of the doubt. Get rid of the unbelief. Get rid of the fear. Believe. Believe what God says. And then you will have it. This isn't some name it, claim it, frame it, get rich scheme. This is the operations of the spirit. This is the operations of the God faith. That we are born of God. We are born of God by faith. Because the word awakens the faith of God in us. That faith comes from God, from faith to faith, from strength to strength, from glory to glory, ever increasing, and you will have what you say. Now, for me, building myself up in my most holy faith comes in a few ways. Number one, I get into the Word. But I don't just get into the Word, I get the Word in me. That my life, my thoughts, my attitude, my words are one and the same as God's word. In other words, God's word becomes my word. God's thoughts become my thoughts. God's promises become my promises. So the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And I allow the, fle- the word to incarnate inside of me, to become one with me through constant meditation. I meditate in the word day and night until that word and me are in total alignment and agreement. And so how do I do that? By spending time in the word. Let the word of God or let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Meditate in my law both day and night. I take note of the word and I study it. I memorize it. I speak it. I think it and I Live it. I do it. Number two. No, that's number one. Did I say that's number one? Yes. Number two. I study the character of God. Because it's not just the word, but it is the God of the word. I want to know him in his power, in his glory, in his reputation. And, and Christians... We think of theologians as those who run schools and speak in Bible schools, and I am a theologian. But every Christian ought to be a theologian. A theologian is one who studies God and studies God's Word. Study to show yourself approved. A workman who need not be ashamed of handling accurately or rightfully the Word of God. So we study the Word, but we don't just study the Word. We study the God of the Word. So I want to go into his word and not just discover his promises, but discover his character. Because his reputation is entwined in his promise. Number three, I'm going to build myself up in my most holy faith by praying in the spirit. That, that is to pray with my understanding, but even beyond my understanding, I'm going to pray in tongues. I'm going to speak in other tongues. I'm going to speak mysteries to God. I'm going to elevate speaking to God, bypassing my understanding and the limits of my, my mind. I'm going to, it's like deep cries out to deep. From the depths of my heart, I cry out to the depths of God's heart. And then God's heart cries out to the depths of mine. We become one. And I build myself up in my holy faith by praying in the Spirit. And, and, and just if you do those three things, we're about to lose power here. Um, we, we will see an increase in elevation of faith. There is other ways to build yourself in faith. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. Get around people that will testify to your life. If you're facing something, go read about people that gained the ascendancy of those circumstances and let their faith encourage you. Go read stories of success and answered prayer and build yourself up in their testimony that their testimony and your testimony will become one and the same. Because God's not a respecter of persons. 
Get in the community of faith because your faith increases in fellowship, in unity, and in communication. So when you're facing some things, some things you face alone, but if you're not getting the ascendancy, get around people of faith who can download the word to you and encourage you, stimulating you in your faith. So get in the word, understand the character of God, pray in the spirit and get around the community of faith to strengthen your faith because two are better than one. And if one will put a thousand to fly, two will put 10,000 and get that collective force of faith around your life. Would you stand with me and let us pray? How many of you know that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen? So you have to look with the eyes of faith. And one of the ways to interpret Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1 is that faith is the title deed of that which you hope for. So you have a title deed to this piece of land. Even when you are away in some place on vacation, this land is yours because you have the title deed. And I'm glad that our governor has confronted the, the misappropriated law in this nation where squatters can come and take over an empty house. You understand? We have laws that protect our property. Uh, but the devil would love to squat on what's yours, to take it over. You need to rise up and put him out that house, that promise. But you have the title deed to what God has given you by faith. Even when you don't see it manifested yet, you will have what you say. There's a gap between when you say it and when it sometimes manifests. That gap is called the trial of your faith, and it's called patience. Through faith and patience, you will inherit the promises of God. If you don't see an instant success, it doesn't mean that your faith has failed. It just means you're going through that period between receiving. When do you get it? When you pray it. <laughs> Not when it manifests. In other words, if I pray, I have it. Then it will manifest. Most people pray and wait for it to manifest and then say, it's mine. When you pray, you have it. You have the title deed to it. It's yours. It just isn't in front of you visibly right now. Invisibly it is in the spirit. It's as sure as it could be. I love Yongi Cho when he was a young preacher. He had a bicycle that no one could see. But he had it, and then he, he got it. He had a desk that no one could see, and they used to mock him, but he possessed the, de the desk before he had a desk. <laughs> you have to possess it the moment you ask for it, and then it will manifest. It's just a matter of time for that which you have received to manifest. That time is called the trial of your faith and it's called the good fight of faith and it's called keep your mouth shut. <laughs> Don't speak contrary to what you have. Give glory to God, not doubt, unbelief. How many of you got something tonight? So I close with these words, have faith in God, have faith from God, have the faith of God and have faith in God. And don't just accept everything that you face as your lot in life, your cross to bear and just speak to that thing and say, be lifted up and cast into the sea and do not doubt you will have what you say. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for your people.
And you said faith comes by hearing, and tonight faith has come. Doubt is gone, unbelief is gone, fear has gone, wrong teaching has gone, opinions that have been orchestrated in hell have gone, and faith has come. They are citizens of the kingdom, a people of faith, the household of God, the household of faith. And I pray, O oh God, that faith would be strengthened in their lives as they give glory to you, that they will not waver through doubt and unbelief, but they will have what they say in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord.